In the famous gold foil experiment, Rutherford and his students, Geiger and Marston, discovered interesting phenomena in the scattering of alpha particles from a thin gold foil. At the time, the somewhat prevailing view of the atom was the plum pudding model, that is, a model where the atom was depicted as a sphere of uniform positive charge throughout the entire radius with some electrons sprinkled in to attain an overall neutral atom. During the gold foil experiment, as the projectile particles impinged upon the foil, the experimenters noticed extremely strong scattering at angles not explainable by the plum pudding depiction. At best, a plum pudding atom should scatter the alpha particles by a fraction of a degree. However, they noticed extremely strong deflections, and even backscatters. The findings were so surprising that Rutherford is known to have said, it was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life. It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. So, he then knew that such strong deflections can only be caused by a dense core, not a uniform spread of positive charge throughout the atomic radius. Hence, this explains why most of the time, the alpha particle just flies right through the atom due to the massive amounts of empty space, except for the electron cloud which couldn't stop the alpha particle. And when it does deflect, it can do so strongly. Okay, so how do we use this to characterize materials? Well. When the incoming alpha particle, say at around 2 MeV of kinetic energy, collides with the target atom, it can scatter in many directions based on how exactly it approached an atom in the sample. Then, due to the mass difference between the projectile and the target particles, the projectile recoils in predictable manners. When the projectile hits the target atom, some of the energy is carried away by the target atom, and the alpha particle recoils with reduced energy. In essence, we can call K the kinematic factor to describe the ratio of the recoiling projectile energy to the initial projectile energy. The trend goes that the kinematic factor, which is a function of both the masses of the projectile and the target particle, as well as the angle at which we recorded a scatter, can go up to 1, as the target atom mass becomes heavier and heavier. However, notice that we didn't actually talk about the probability of observing the scattering event at a given angle. Now, consider a beam of particles hitting a sample and a detector placed at some angle to capture the backscatter. The differential scattering cross-section is, def is defined uh, from taking into account the solid angle recorded by the detector, the total number of particles that have impinged on the target, as well as the number of particles actually captured by that solid angle in that detector. So, you get an expression that ties in the atomic numbers of both the target and the projectile, the energy, as well as the angle at which your detector is placed. Okay, so now how do we know how far into the sample the projectile recoiled from? After all, not all backscatters are from the surface. The idea is that as the projectile traverses into the target, the interactions with the electron clouds slowly bleeds away the energy from the projectile. As such, when the projectile finally recoils from a nucleus and then again comes back out of the sample and hits the detector, the energy it will register will be less than that recorded from a uh, projectile recoiling from the surface. The term for this uh, section that we described is the stopping power. Okay, let's recap the past few explanations. We have the kinematic factor, the differential scattering cross-section, and the stopping power. Of course, there are many fine details that show up depending on your choice of energies, projectiles, and samples, but in general, the aforementioned terms, provided you know the projectile's characteristics and of course your detector angle, the remaining data in those terms is that from the sample. This highlights the power of this tool. Non-destructive, well up to a degree it is. Depth profiling studies at around 1-2 to two micron depth of materials ranging from light to heavy atoms again, with limitations. So, what does the data actually look like? Let's take an example of a thin gold layer atop a silicon substrate. Let's start with gold. The scatter from the surface will show up at a given position on our histogram of counts versus energy. For gold, a somewhat heavier atom, the scatter will yield a decent amount of counts 
and placement on the energy spectrum. Then, because our gold is some small thickness, we get the backscatter spot of the deep end of the gold a bit lower in energy. Next, we know that silicon is a light element, and so we receive a lower signal both in counts and on the energy spectrum. But that spectrum extends all the way to the zero energy because the thickness of the substrate can be considered much higher than the penetration depth of the helium projectile at the mod modest energy that we usually operate at, which is around 2 MeV. Note also, the silicon's leading edge is shifted back slightly, as the projectiles that recoiled from the surface of the silicon had to first lose some energy as they traveled through the gold layer. This way, we know elemental identities, stoichiometry, well, by the comparison of signal strengths, depths, and profiles, all without needing to completely destroy a sample. But some limitations include needing to know the density of the sample beforehand, and also not easily being able to know the chemical structure, only the composition. And this is due to the fact that we're exploiting like nuclear to nuclear interactions for scattering. With that in mind, we can still say that Rutherford backscattering spectrometry is an invaluable tool for our studies in material science.